I was going to catch a train in the subway When I hear a strange song coming from down there So I see people, so I hear me right, There's an author called George Lamming from Barbados Yeah He's about 92 now and he moved to London a very long time ago, but he's, he lives in Barbados now. And he said it's the first, when he came to England, it's the first ever time he saw himself as a West Indian. Is that something you can kind of identify well, with? Yeah, I mean, but that's what I'm saying. We didn't know. When you come, it's only when you come here, you know you were nobody. Yeah. And when I say nobody, anybody that's black is nobody. Yeah. I mean, people call me and ask me, where's your tail? Because they think you're a monkey. Mm. But yeah, you know. But I didn't really mean, yeah, but at the end of the day, that's your experience, isn't it? But it's more of a thing like, because you, you weren't just connected with people simply because they were black. They were connected with people probably because they had similarities, I guess. Or not, not so. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly what he meant mm. as a West Indian. But, but, you know, but you know what you but mean. But I know what I <laughs> mean. I mean, yeah. when I came here, to me, I felt like I'm irrelevant mm -hmm. as a human being mm -hmm. because in the Caribbean, as I say, I remember, you got to take into account, as I say, I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So the experience that he would have had maybe would be totally different. Yeah. I came here and I went to sign up for school. But I, first of all, in that experience was it was a shock to me because in Antigua you could go to school till you're 21. Mm -hmm. There was guys that smoking and things like that. You could go to school till 21. Mm -hmm. There was no barrier, barrier mm -hmm. in terms of the you service in boys' school. They had a, a class they called post primary, mm -hmm. and that was all adults mm -hmm. basically. You know, from the time you're 16, you can go into post-primary, 17, 18, 19, you can go. Once, once you don't have a job, you can go to school. Mm -hmm. And most people, you can leave from there and go and do a trade. So the guys, them that was going to that. So why I'm saying that is that the experience that someone will have, when you come here, you realize it's a totally different experience because people look at you and call you something else mm -hmm. that you're not like what you used to be mm -hmm. you know I mean uh, you know I don't I haven't experienced being a Caribbean and I mean my mm -hmm. my experience is like I knew I, I mean I, what's a West Indian what's mm -hmm. I mean I don't know anything about West Indian. I mm -hmm. even know about an Antiguan. Yeah, 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 of course. You know, and I've been to St. Croix as an age of 12. So I knew there was people from the U.S. Virgin Islands mm -hmm. who were cushions. Mm -hmm. Now, in Antigua, when you go to St. Croix, they call it Garrett. Yeah, yeah. So I know about Garrett's. Mm -hmm. But um, a West Indian, what's a West Indian? I don't know mm -hmm. about that. So. His experience is, is like his experience. I knew that taught me, I've learned that a West Indian, the West Indies, the name West Indies come because Columbus got thought, got lost, and he thought he was in the West of India. Mm -hmm. So he says he arrived in the West Indies. But um, I don't know what he meant by he knew. I think what he actually meant is that it's the first time he was able to meet other people from the West Indies and actually identify with them. That's what he meant. But yeah, everyone interpret yeah. everyone interprets it a yeah. different way. Um, I was gonna say, um, you're saying that though. Did you play cricket growing up? Yeah. Yeah. So you had to. Yeah, you had to. <laughs> what was that like? That was. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I I played cricket at school. Mm. And we used to have competitions against other schools. Mm -hmm. What school I, did you go to? I went to boys' school. Okay. Um, now, boys' school was one of the, the most um, famous school for cricket. Boys' school and grammar school was the head of, in Antigua anyway, for cricket. 
you know, most the people them there known as cricketers, if you like. Now, I wasn't very good, mm -hmm. but I could wicked keep. Mm -hmm. Now, my problem was I like bowling. Mm -hmm. And if you're a wicked keeper, you can't bowl. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the school, the, I played in a, my, they had a, my um, school had farms, which is Stephen, Aggregate, and Washington. And if you're in one of those, you have to play against, Stephen will play against Washington and play against so yeah. yeah. So I had a, a friend of mine, uh, another colleague, Conrad Buckley, he could we could keep too. Mm -hmm. So we would split the difference between we, when I want to bowl, mm -hmm. he will we could, we could keep, mm -hmm. and that's how I used to share my time on the cricket ground. Now we'll play against other schools, and that was big fun and f Friday afternoon. Coming to England now, mm -hmm. I obviously played cricket on the park we I actually we used to play and little cushion that's what we you, you kneel down mm -hmm. and play I don't know if you know that no, one I actually that, don't know about that one that, that one yeah. was uh, tell you that was fun mm -hmm. you use a golf ball mm -hmm. and you kneel down on one knee yeah. and you play you know yeah. the, the ball like that but we set up one in Spinel Park here and we used to have some fun playing that. But the bigger guys, because um, most of the people in Antigua who came here, came to Leicester. Mm -hmm. And there was a group of guys here that was very good. Mm -hmm. They could play for the West Indies. I mean, they were oh, wow. one of, the, well, a couple of them used to actually play for the Leeward Islands and things like that, represent the island. Mm -hmm. Now, when they, we had an Antigua team, well, them days, they called it the West Indies team mm -hmm. when we came here. Mm -hmm. And um, they, we used to have matches against all the factories and different there. But when these guys are playing against us, mm -hmm. they think they're playing against the, kind of the West <laughs> Indies team. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. But the thing is, when we had um, the break, we got to the, they had the pub, mm -hmm. and you go and have a drink. Mm -hmm. We can't go in the pub. Oh, man. We have to stay outside. Okay. You know, this is in the earth. Yeah. You stay outside, and that used to create a lot of tension, tension and fights. Mm -hmm. Because when it ended, you know, there was a couple of guys that they could call names that they wouldn't stand for that. Yeah. And they would be, at the end of the, they wait till the end of the match. When we don't beat them <laughs> off, then, They'll you they'll go in the, and as soon as anything, they, they get thumped. Yeah. Now, that was an issue. Okay. But I dropped out of cricket mm -hmm. because I, unfortunately, used to have to drive the guys them and go and pick up people mm -hmm. because I had the vehicle. Mm -hmm. I had the, the, the main bus that I'm talking about. So I used to carry them to the cricket match. Mm -hmm. And it's only if they're shorter men, I would play. Yeah. Because there was... I didn't like the idea. There was a couple of guys there, about four of them, that I can call. That once they bat, mm -hmm. they make all the runs. Mm -hmm. So they, anybody under number four, over no, number not four, getting not getting any, yeah, yeah. any <laughs> batting, <laughs> you only, they only need you for the feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? So I used to say, well, look, if you need, if you have an ex, if you need an extra man, call mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And there was. Me and another friend of mine used to be always together, and he was a fast bowler. Mm -hmm. So if they're batting first, he would go and do his stint, mm -hmm. and we just go and sit down, and we go and pick up somebody mm -hmm. at the hospital. They, if there's a girl or a guy that want to come mm -hmm. to the mat, we'll go and pick them up. Mm -hmm. As I said, because I used to drive, mm -hmm. and that was the life. So I didn't play mm -hmm. a lot of cricket. There was one incident that put me off. A friend of mine got hit in his face with the ball and his glasses, and I had to take him to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that 
to me, it was too much. It was a bit much yeah. for nothing because yeah. it was just <laughs> yeah, playing for game. the fun of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. But yes, um, we all, it was routine mm -hmm. that once them days you had to play cricket because mm -hmm. that's the only thing you knew. Mm -hmm. it, there wasn't some sort of football and thing like that. So everybody played cricket and all Caribbean people play cricket, mm -hmm. no matter where you come from. I was going to ask you, given the climate that you were living in and you said that obviously there was tension and obviously the, 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 the what do you call the natives weren't really interacting and that kind of talk. What was it like? in the 70s watching the West Indies speak Oh gosh, God. that was heaven man. <laughs> I mean, when there was a quick match, yeah. I mean, that lift us. Mm -hmm. That, you know, once they see that season is on, mm -hmm. and if uh, the West Indies come to England, you know, you, well, that's all we have to look forward to. That's mm -hmm. the only thing, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have nothing else. I mean, you can't even say, well, we didn't even have the Bob Marley and the this and the that. You had mm -hmm. the American singers mm -hmm. and so on that you could say, well, look, we can relate to, mm -hmm. to that. But the cricket lift us and made you feel, and even to the people here, the English uh, indigenous people, they would look at you and think, well, yeah, you, you know, you're good, you're mm -hmm. worth something mm -hmm. because your team is winning. You know, and they always win. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, not like these days. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yes, that was a big lift for us. It made you feel well. You, you know, you're worth something because at least they can't beat you. I mean, it's like when you're going to school. The ones that you go to school with, and you're you're playing against them or you're running against them at least. The youths them used to feel good because they can go against, you know, compete with them mm -hmm. and win because nobody can hold you back. Mm -hmm. It's like I took my kids, them, I used to get them involved with cricket and tennis and things like that when Ash was playing. Now, that made me want my kids to play tennis mm -hmm. because he done well for himself yeah, as yeah, a black yeah. man. So I took my kids them to a tennis club, two boys, and um, the people them basically said, oh, you can't sign up here. Wow. It's the special members. <sighs> and I went back to a friend of mine, a white guy, and I gave him a son to take, and he got him to sign up. Okay. But then after a while, my son don't want to play. Yeah, yeah, he just got, you know, yeah. just didn't, want to go yeah. you know i wanted him to go yeah, but yeah. he didn't want to go so there must be things other things on the ground mm -hmm. that he didn't like you know and that's the sort of thing that we were up against but definitely the caribbean the west indies team used to live for us i mean i used to take my kids because i'm family to viv richards okay. and the kids them we used to go to the matches mm -hmm. and the white Guys, them used to buy the kids them crisp and coke mm -hmm. and so on, just because, well, <laughs> he got some connection with yeah, the yeah, pictures, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, it's a shame, but that's, that's, that's how life was, was yeah. you know. Oh, gosh. Uh, what I was, one of the things I was particularly interested in was obviously the Antiguan community in Leicester. It's like, the, like Antigua was just decided to come. I knew, I know there were some in Ipswich for a while. Yeah. And, Obviously, if you go to Hackney, Stoke yeah. Newington, a lot around there. But one of the questions is, why do you think so many came to Leicester? Because I know a lot of Anguillans went to Slough and yeah. some Antigas, but they mostly went there and they ended up working for Mars. And I know the big Mars factory was yeah. there. And so what my question is, why did a lot of Antigans come to Leicester? And did they come from a particular place in Leicester? Because what we found a couple yeah. of years ago was... My uncle does some stuff for Antiguan Football Association and a lot of the people were coming from particular parts. Their grandparents or parents came from particular parts. So anyway, let me not talk too much. Yeah, yeah. Um, from my experience, um, my dad came in 57. Mm -hmm. Now, he knew someone from his village that came here before him. Mm -hmm. And 
he gravitated to that. That's why he came to Leicester. Mm -hmm. Now, I know of friends of his who come because he's here. Mm -hmm. And I do know that some people that came stayed in London for a while and because they hear that somebody is from Leicester here, they will come over and live here, come and settle here because they know somebody there. The environment, as I said, London is a big place and most of the people that moved to London was in, as I said, North London, Sandringham Street. My grandfather lived Well, I'm, I'm telling you where, yeah. I know, I mean, yeah. I've been here for a long time. Yeah. So I know where, more or less, every Antiguan live in London. Wow, okay. Yeah, because as I said, because of the, the driving, it, not many people drove then. Yeah. You know, in the 60, I, I passed my test in 62. Um, 62, yeah, 62. And I had a vehicle from then. I bought my first car for 35 pounds. Mm -hmm. And the second one, the van I bought later on the same year. But the, what I'm saying is, we used to leave London, Leicester, to London, mm -hmm. and I would go to more or less every Antigua house, because my father didn't drive. So I used to have to drive him, and he knew where everybody uh So that's how I can tell you about the Antiguan community. And I know some friends of his moved to Leicester because he could get them a better job. And you could uh, so, um, kind of socialize with your friends from the Caribbean because they live in Leicester. Um, I think people gravitate to where they knew somebody. And you only want to come to Leicester or to say, my dad will get your job without even asking. You know, he can get, he get almost anybody jobs. Mm -hmm. Them days, as I say, he worked with net plastic and they, you could start out there. Mm -hmm. And they paid pretty well so he could get your job there and then you can go and get something else that you need or uh, you want, your preference, preference in jobs. So I don't know if it's, um, I think mainly it's because people knew. I mean, I know the men wearings, they came to Leicester in the 55, or 54, 54. This, this sort of man, um, 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 oh, Henry, mm -hmm. he was here from 49. Wow. And um, these are people that established themselves here. There's a Mr. Joseph, who his son and me went to school. And um, when I came here and I found out that they were in Leicester, it was like, I'm home. Mm -hmm. Because me and his son was in class together. I mean, so it made um, it made you feel good to know that well, there's people that you know in that area, in the, and you will come and want to be with them or near them. I think that's mainly the reason why so many Antiguans are here. Same with Barbudan. There was a big Barbudan community here. Yeah, there still is, and it's because of that early settlement. Antiguans, Barbudans came to Leicester and the people in those come. And if you come and, because people used to come to England without an address. Mm -hmm. They just say, oh, they're going to London. And they would tell them, like, if you go to the police station, I know people used to have to go to the police station to find out where the black people live. Mm -hmm. And they would tell you where, what area, like in high fields, they would tell you, Oh, you want to go in high fields? I'll go to the train station, and there's a black man work there, and you go and see him, mm -hmm. and you got your suitcase. You just come off mm -hmm. the bus or the, the boat or whatever, come to Leicester, mm -hmm. and you come off the train station, and you'll ask this man where somebody lives that you can get a room from, mm -hmm. and he will either take you in until you find someone, 
ask you who you know, where you're from. You take it to somebody that from the village that you're from, and then you, you're home, basically. So I think that's the reason why people settle here. I mean, in in Leeds, I know that's how a lot of Kittishan is there because of the same reason. The only part the people go there and they follow them. Mm -hmm. uh, your family gravitate towards that. Yeah, it seems like that's the, the main kind of um, story. Yeah. I was going to ask, were there any um, main, no, was there any interesting characters from the community that, you, that stood out for you? Yes, <laughs> yes, there, there, there was. <laughs> um, there was. Um, uh, there was a couple that I can. There was a guy we used to relate to as cowboy, mm -hmm. and I can remember him as a kid. He's from Erlins, and he lived in Leicester. And just like how he lived in Antigua, he used to dress like a cowboy, mm -hmm. like this Western cowboy with his hat felt hat and his guns and his waist and so on. And he came to Leicester. He was living here. He had a bike, just like he had in Antigua, all dressed up with the flags, you know, and things. And he lived his life like a cowboy, and that's what they called him here. Now, there was another guy who um, came from St. John's. Um, his father, Connie, what was his surname? I can't remember his name, his surname at the moment, but um, he, his father is from, he's from a well-to-do family. And they sent him away because he was bringing a, like a disgrace to the family. Okay. You know, because he was like one of the boys. Mm -hmm. And um, he came here and he lived, we used to call him Buckham. <laughs> um, because he was big, and if you if you have a problem, <laughs> he will help you to sort it out. He's a fighter. There was another guy, Geese. He's living in um, he's living in London. Um, he they did the documentary on him in prison at eighty. Uh, he's a oh um. I know who you're talking about. I don't know. Hughes. Oh. His, his surname is Hughes. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Zeke. Okay, no, no, no. I don't think so. No, I don't. I don't know. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. They did. He was 80 yards and they did a documentary on him. And so many people had done a documentary on him in prison. Okay. But he was living in Leicester too. Mm. And if. I mean, I can tell you an example with me. There was me and this friend of mine was walking down Melbourne Road. Big guy, tall guy, Fitzroy. And three white guys walk up and cat, caught us up and were walking with us. And they start asking us if we're from around here. And we said, no, we're from Mill Hill Lane, which is a little way away. And, um, we say, you got any friends around here? We said, no, 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 no. And, you know, they start, so you don't know anybody around here and so. We said, no, we going to Prospect Hill where we got some friends. And they start to, all of a sudden got drunk. You know, they start staggering and jamming on us. <laughs> they were picking a fight. Okay. So we start fighting. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, um, Obviously, we, well, not obvious, but we got the better then. <laughs> okay, yeah, Because, yeah. you know. So, one was on the floor, <laughs> and we kicking the hell out of it. Anyway, the police van pull up. Mm -hmm. And they, they grabbed me and my friend and chuck us in the van. Mm -hmm. And tell the guys, them go ahead. And this white lady come out, and she, grab onto the wing mirror of the van. Mm -hmm. 
And she say, oh, let them go, let them go. They didn't do anything, it's not them, it's not them. It's them other guys. And they tell her, go ahead, they pull her off the van and tell her, go ahead, go back in, it's all right. She said, no, it's me, call the police. And, me call. and you know, she hold on to the door mm -hmm. and she would not move until they let us go. Mm -hmm. And that was an experience. Now, if they, she didn't do that, we would have gone to the police and she didn't get a good beating mm -hmm. from the police. That was common. Mm -hmm. Now, why I'm saying that, this same guy that they did the interview on, there was two guys, him and this other man named Wally Twaits, who is a Nantegan too, and he, he was like two characters that if there's a fight, we only want to say Twaits or Wally, you know. And once anybody, if the police at the end they hear that name, they're gone. <laughs> and the same fella that I'm talking about, the, um, Zeke. Mm -hmm. If you say Zeke, Zeke, and the police uh, come, because uh, so and so anything, them days, you know, they're going around in their vans and mm -hmm. cars and whatever, mainly vans. And if they see black people, they approach you, mm -hmm. whether you're doing anything or not, wanting to where you're going and mm -hmm. what you're up to and so on. And you just have to say, Zeke! <laughs> and the police said, my God, can they know him? Because he, he beat a lot of police, I tell you. He was one of these guys. He, he kind of knocked me, you know? And when you see he kick, you know, you don't know where the feet coming from. And it was like, a, he spent most of his life in jail. Oh, man. Oh, That's man. why they did this documentary. They reckon it's the oldest. Yeah, that they have, you know, but it was a good documentary because it talked, you know, it, it tell you about mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. you know, and he had to be like that and so on. And I think he's still alive, mm -hmm. but he's in his 80s, or mm -hmm. uh, maybe 90s now. But um, yes, there's a few characters that we used to have in Leicester. Um, Wally Twaits. Um, this same guy is Zeke, mm -hmm. is the Joseph is Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. um, he moved to London after a while because it was just was too small for him. Mm -hmm. And um, then we had um, an African guy um, who was a back boxer, Alex Barrow. Um, he was. He done a lot for this city. He and Tom Jones used to be very good friends. Tom Jones used to come to Leicester regularly by him. He used to have a club. Okay. And um, Tom Jones was regularly in this same street. I see him. And then he had a boxing club on London Road near the train station. But he died early, he, maybe in his 40s. Um, yeah, there's some characters, Leonard Spencer, mm -hmm. you know, they're all more or less all gone now, but, you know. Um, there, weren't, there weren't any women characters at all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, uh, I don't know what you mean by women characters, <laughs> like no, Christy like, Kilo. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe this, they were just well known, or I don't know. Yeah, I mean. they, yes, I mean, there was... People who are well known for, you know, different reasons. There's a couple of singers that we can be proud of. Millie and Millie, Pearl and Millie, they're known as. Um, one of them just turned 80 about a month ago. She invited me to a party, so it's nice to mention her. She go back. They go back a long way. Um, they used to entertain us. They had a, used to sing them, sing, a, sing in a band. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a couple of bands here. But um, yeah, they, as ladies, are known for good reason. There's some other characters that been around. I uh, don't want to get into trouble <laughs> right, right, yeah, we'll calling that, yeah. names, we'll but, um, yeah. you know, um, there's 
one woman, because you're asking about women, mm -hmm. I mean, it might sound a bit biased, but it's true. Um, there's L.V. Martin, mm -hmm. who still come to this center, she's in her 80s, mm -hmm. and volunteer mm -hmm. to be on the reception. She started the Leicester Caribbean Carnival with others, um, with Funny Man, mm -hmm. which is uh, Walton George, mm -hmm. is Steve Panis, myself, Lionel. I mean, she done wonders for this city, mm -hmm. Mrs. Martin. L.V. Martin. I think she, her name is up there in the calder somewhere. Um, there's a, you know, I mean, I, I don't really like calling too yeah, much no, 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 name no, no, because no, no, people yeah. sometimes think that you're, you know, you're being unfair and they didn't yeah. call their That's name fine, and so yeah. on. But um, there's a few women. I mean, I'm saying women because you mentioned women and young people too. Um, Pam Campbell, she's done quite a lot in the community. And as a driving instructor, you see, some people give people an identity. And that's what uh, I'm thinking of. People who you can look at somebody and say, right, they have stood out in the community. They stand for something, and even through the difficult days, they have stood up. And I think Pam um, Anne was one of the first approved driving instructor in Leicester mm -hmm. as a black person, mm -hmm. and that's saying something, mm -hmm. you know, because it wasn't easy to get recognized by the authorities, mm -hmm. you know, once you're black. So it's nice when you see somebody come to, because I, I, I can say that, I mean, I had to get a white man to sign for a garage for me from the local authority. I want the garage. I went about it and I can't get it. It's gone. It's taken out. And I get to tell somebody about it. And the guy go and get it and then give it to me, you know, which is sad, you know. So there's a few people that have actually tried and stood up for themselves. Um, I'm going to ask you about what was it like? Because I can't imagine what it was like, because obviously I was born here, but given the experiences that you had, like when you started having children, what started going through your mind in terms of raising them in this environment? Because especially you talked about that 1981 experience when you went to the US and yeah. certain things triggered in your mind. Um, yeah, that's... Um, uh, <laughs> I can see I've got you thinking there. No, that's a good <laughs> subject. Um, it's close to home. Um, but what I was... In, in answer to that question, I mean, I met my wife in well, girlfriend then in 67. Yeah. Was she from Antigua? She's from Antigua, but she came here when she was about eight. Okay. But um, she's from a Christian family mm -hmm. and they want, she wanted uh, like marriage before you have, you know, <laughs> sex, yeah. With, yeah. you know, yeah. and that sort of thing. <laughs> now, um, I, because of my experience, and as I said to you, moving people and so on, mm -hmm. I wasn't too ready for this marriage business and so on. Anyhow, um, when she, she got pregnant before she got married, mm -hmm. and um, I said basically that I don't want my kids to live in anybody's house mm -hmm. before I have a house. So that was my excuse not to get married. Mm -hmm. um, um, unfortunately, when she do have the child, I run around looking for somewhere to buy. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the money, but I wanted to buy somewhere anyway. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, that um, I mentioned it earlier, and I went to this place that uh, house that I think I could afford to get the deposit on. Mm -hmm. And um, the woman says to me, "Well, no, you can't. Um, she can't sell it to me because she can't. The neighbor wouldn't like it." So I seen a house in Wixton, where in, not very far from the area that I went to look at this other house, because I didn't want my kids them to grow up in the black area. Mm -hmm. Because you had this perception that everything around here is bad. Mm -hmm. Because that's how it seems. All police always coming to your door and you know, all the kids them get in trouble at school because of the prejudice. See, we as adults didn't know what the kids were going through. But they were going through more than what we were going through. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we just go to work and back. They were going to school and kids at the school who were prejudiced even though we didn't think kids are prejudiced, but because they got it from their parents. They were calling them names and things like that and spitting at them that we didn't know because they're not going to come home and tell you, oh, this kid spit at me or whatever. So anyway, I decided to look at, I look at a house that nobody was living in and I went and make an offer for it. And the, the estate agent says to me, oh, I don't think that they would sell. So I says, well, can I put in an offer anyway? So he says, okay, we'll get back to you. And I put in an offer and then they wrote to me and says, well, the people said they want to sell the house, but the offer is not good enough. So I says, um, what's the offer? So they said they want the asking price. So I says, well, no, I can't have it. So I offered them a bit more and I think it was something like 300, 400 pounds. I think it was. And they says, they wrote me back and says, no, that they can't accept that. So then I said, well, that's all I can do. Anyway, the man said, well, I'll have another talk with them and I'll see. Then he went back and said, that's okay. So I said, all right, I'll have it. And I went to try and pull some money together. And I could only manage 300. So I went back to the agent and said, oh, I can only get 300. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, you can't buy it then. So I said, okay. And I got a letter about two weeks later saying the people say, okay, because mm -hmm. they can't sell it. Mm -hmm. And um, I were able to buy, buy that house. And my kids then grew up where you know, in them days, if you have a child and you can't make the cry in somebody's house, or else they would tell you you have to find somewhere to go. You can't touch the wallpaper. Mm -hmm. Them days, every house had in wallpaper. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was very difficult for kids and parents to live in somebody else's house. Um, I don't know if your mom would have told you when you live in a room, you're using the stove and you put money in and then mm. when you go to use it, there's no money in it. Yeah. And My mom grew up in Antigua, so she didn't Oh, really, well, yeah. yeah. Well, your grandfather, yeah, was, they uh, would tell you, they, you know, they, that's the sort of thing that yeah. we had to do. You had to punch money in. Mm -hmm. And the money lasts for so long. They use, or somebody you, mm -hmm. else use the, the gas or the water, whatever, because you have to get hot water. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided to, I got this place but I couldn't afford to have put Maintain furniture in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was empty. I yeah. couldn't afford to put furniture. So I, a friend of mine had problems. He had twins yeah. and he was living in a coal attic yeah. and the kids then were getting bronchitis and oh, all that. Yeah. So I said to him, well, look, you can go and live in the house that I have got. Cause I was <coughs> fortunate. I was living in my mom's house, mm -hmm. you know? So my girlfriend was staying somewhere else and I, she living in somebody's house because the baby was that small. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, um, you could go and live in the house. And he went and lived in the house until I could afford to furnish it because he had some furniture. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how we started out. Mm -hmm. But it was very difficult for people with kids. Now, I didn't, uh, my kids then went to school in that area, area mm -hmm. which was a very good school until it come to exam time. 
And um, well, before Ed, one one of my boy, the eldest was twelve. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, the, mm -hmm. the eldest was twelve, and one day, a kid come and knock the door a Sunday, and I went to open the door, and the kid asked me if my son was playing out. The eldest one was playing out, so I says, I don't know. I will ask him. So he went and asked him. I went and asked him, and he said, tell him I'm not playing out. So the way he said it, I thought it was strange. So when I went back in, I said, well, how old is that child? He says, 12. So I said, but you're 16. He says, I said, why are you playing with somebody that age? He says, the kids them his age are not doing the things that he does. So I said, well, what are they doing? He said, well, they're standing down the road and smoking and drinking and mm -hmm. so on. There's a gang up outside of a pub. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me. Oh. Sweating. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he says, they're not doing the things that he does. So I says, oh, strange. So I said, why? Why is that? He says, well, all the kids in this area, once they come 13, 14, they start going to the pub and standing up and smoking and so on. And I thought to myself, well, I'm doing something wrong here. Mm -hmm. So I come into Highfields mm -hmm. and bought a house in Highfields, mm -hmm. which is the same black area where there's drugs and everything. Mm -hmm. And people said to me that I'm mad mm -hmm. to bring my kids them back in here. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, I didn't have any pro problem up there. So I can't have any problem here, because mm -hmm. I've already got my principles, if you like. Yeah. Now, I um, notice all their kids, they're still going to the same school in that area, mm -hmm. but all their friends now coming into high fields. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they're hip, you know, mm -hmm. and they, you know. Mm -hmm. They never come to the house in Wixton where they're nearer to them, mm -hmm. but they come into high fields mm -hmm. because they're doing the things, high field guys them are doing the things that they want to do, mm -hmm. you know. And um, that opened my eyes and I thought to myself, well, it's a good thing I moved them into high fields mm -hmm. because now they have identity. Mm -hmm. And the kids them was a lot, my boys them was a lot, there were three boys, they were a lot happier mm -hmm. in themselves and more outgoing. And I thought to myself, well, you know, they've been holding themselves back. They don't go to, they don't drink, they don't smoke drugs, they don't go to the <laughs> pub, they don't, you know, but they play the music and they're happier. Mm -hmm. They have their friends come and go, you know, and I thought to myself, well, look, it's a good job that this experience happened to me, mm -hmm. that I could be able to bring them back and make them be normal mm -hmm. and see that they are somebody because I used to ask them things like why they're not playing rugby and football and so on and they used to give me some excuses that they don't the big one used to say well he can't play he don't play football because um his he wear glasses mm -hmm. um he used to do BMX racing and so on and things like that. And I used to accept these excuses until one day I went to the school. They had, um, it was doing this A levels. Yeah, A levels. Yeah, and um, I went, they were, they were putting him for seven lessons. But it, it was in maths and English. And I thought, well, funny. Those are the two main things. And that kid is a bright kid. So I thought to myself, well, I'll go to school and find out what. So I went and seen the teacher and I said, well, look, why is it you only putting him for these things, science and this and that? So they says to me that they don't think he would pass the maths and the English, yeah. and it's better for him to go in for something that he would pass because it wouldn't look good. And this, I says, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not happy with that. Yeah, of course. I says, you 
taught him from the time he was 12 until now he's 16 and you cannot teach him at to a level that he can enter mm -hmm. there's something wrong with you so the teacher said mr francis you have been disrespectful so say i am you should have to examine yourself mm -hmm. because you taught him from his 12 mm -hmm. english mm -hmm. and maths mm -hmm. is another thing i says i rely on my son to read the newspaper to me every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I rely on him. Mm -hmm. And he was, he been doing that from the time he was seven. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling me that he can't enter English, then something is wrong. This area that he grew up in, hardly any black people are here, it's all English people. So wh how do you get to English? Anyway, he said, well, I will, I will prove to you that he wouldn't. I will enter him, but you have to pay for it. I said, fine. And he entered it, and he entered two more courses. They passed 11 of them. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the teacher and said, see, he said, well, I was mistaken because he don't talk a lot. He, he just sit quietly wow. and do his job, do his work. And why is that a problem? If he's doing, if he's doing it quietly and he's doing it correctly, why is that a problem? Exactly. I had that problem earlier on when he was in an earlier, when he was about nine or ten. In yeah. And what, I went to the school then, because what they said, he, he do, he's not forceful when they ask questions, he wouldn't answer, you know, he wouldn't show up and answer. So I said to him, why? He says, well, they never asked me. And he's at the back, at the, you know, in the second to last row at the back. And then, you know, he don't get a chance to. So I says to the teacher, can you move him up to the front, please? And then see how it operates. And change. So because I was that kind of forceful, mm -hmm. I was able to control, uh, not so control, get most out of them. Mm -hmm. And they all did pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, I said very well mm, that's good to that I am proud yeah. that I did take the steps that I, st I took. But that's happened to quite a few people in our community that most of the black kids then get expelled. Mm. And they mostly get expelled because we didn't get involved with the schools. And it's not so much because of we didn't want to. But a lot of us were doing an eight to six job. Okay. And it was very difficult to intermingle. Mm -hmm. And because of our upbringing in the Caribbean, you do not challenge teachers, mm -hmm. doctors, anybody in authority. You do not challenge that. And this is where a lot of us went wrong because we had that principle from back home in the Caribbean that you don't ask if your teachers say, they're wrong, then they're wrong. You know, the kids are wrong. And a lot of them get expelled unjustly because nobody, they speak up for them and their parents don't take the time out to go and deal with or just make the teachers know who they are. You know, and that's a problem that I find we, we face. As far as my kids are concerned, that's where I think, um, you know, we, we, I went wrong, that, uh, well, not went wrong, but went, took the stand that helped them to achieve and can challenge things because they see me do that, you know. You obviously would have taken them to Antigua. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. How, how did they, did they like it? Oh, they, they loved it. Actually, that <laughs> that fall right into the same principle that I'm talking about with the teachers. I took. I had a difficulty them days. It was I was in the car business, mm -hmm. so it wasn't. I wasn't traveling because of the travel agent. I was in the car business, and I used to take them to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. 
because my aim was to go back to the Caribbean to live. Mm -hmm. And I always say when they get to the age of, the last one get to the age of 18, mm -hmm. I would have gone. So from the age of, my first time I took them, they were five, my youngest one was three months okay. when he went to the Caribbean. Yeah. Because he was christened in Antigua. Oh, wow. At yeah. the church that I was christened in. Oh, okay. To that deliberately. Yeah, yeah. Now, the other two I took when they were seven and five. And they loved it. To the extent that one day one of them said to me, we went to an uncle of mine who had some a ground. We got orange and sugar apple and things like that. And the, my son says, oh, he love it here because he can never hungry. Now, I thought to myself, well, boy, you're never hungry in England. So mm -hmm. I talk about it. Now, mm -hmm. I know that I used to be hungry in Antigua. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> if you tell me that he's never hungry in Antigua, then something is wrong with me in England. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, that I did. Now, the same school that I'm talking about, they used to take my kids, them, uh, their kids in their class, to the swimming baths once a week as part of the curriculum, mm -hmm. you know. And um, after they've been to the Antigua the second time, one day my son says he didn't go to the swimming thing. Two of them didn't go to the swimming thing. So I says, why? No, one didn't go. So I says, why? He says, well, the same like Wayne. Wayne didn't go. He's the elder one. He didn't go because he can swim. Mm. So I said, well, that's wrong. So I went to see the teacher. Mm. And he says, well, since they come back from Antigua, they just jump in the pool and they can swim more than the other kids them. So with that, they, they ban them. Yeah, no, you can't ban someone for that. So I said, so because they're good. Do something to make them even better. You are telling me they can't go, and that's a part of the, so when you take your, the rest of the class, mm -hmm. <coughs> you leave them sitting on the side. And it, that stayed like that. I didn't challenge it too much, because they say it's dangerous to the other kids, because the other kids want to do that. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I thought, well, no, okay. <laughs> but you know, now I would have, Fight them. yeah. yeah. Because I knew I know different. Yeah. But that's the sort of thing that you get. They love the Caribbean and now at their age now, I mean my eldest is fifty. Mm -hmm. And he's got more friends in the Caribbean, in Antigua I should say, mm -hmm. than me. Mm -hmm. Because they've been going there every two years. It was very convenient for me when I was doing mechanic because I was registered for VAT and the situation in with VAT those days was that you could only earn seven hundred and fifty pounds before you start paying VAT. And one year the VAT people came to my house at seven o'clock in the morning to check my books and they were there all day. And when they finished they said I was like something like three pence out or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they disciplined me. Said wow, that, free tea. that, yeah, they said that is not supposed to happen. So um, I got to get an accountant. I said, but I do my books myself. I said, it cost me money to do get an accountant, and I do get a bookkeeper to check them over. So he says, well, that's stealing. We put that down to stealing. But what happened was. I wouldn't let them smoke in my house. So they had to go in the garden and smoke. And they didn't like that. I didn't realize that that's a problem. It says, so the guy says to me, well, it took us longer than normal because normally we smoke and do the books and, you know, instead of going in the garden. And so that's when I realized, well, oh, that's why you're, so he says, so from then, uh, the next morning, the Monday, I wrote a letter to the VAT people and they registered. Mm -hmm. So every summer, when the school gets holidays, I close my workshop <laughs> and go to Antigua with the kids there. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't go every summer. Um, the first summer, I went to Antigua. The next summer, I went to Mabletop. And it cost me more. Mabletop is a seaside. Okay. It's, it's Cagnes. It cost me more to go to Mabletop <laughs> than it did for the week. I went for week, one week. Mm -hmm. No, two weeks. And I took some friends of mine, kids with me. And um, I got children there. And it cost me more than it did for the Caribbean. So from that, every two years, I take them to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And that's how we live. So I lock up the garage every two years for two months, go to the Caribbean. So I don't have to pay VAT. Mm -hmm. Don't have to be registered for VAT. And it was restricting on my uh, income, mm -hmm. but at least I was with the kids them, and they enjoyed the Caribbean. And I couldn't do that now because they would, if you take them out to school, or you miss any part. Yeah. But them days we used to get seven, eight weeks holiday anyway. Yeah. So it was convenient to me then, and they, that's how they grew up. So they knew they got friends in the Caribbean that. They're close to. Yeah. I mean, and some of them are doing business, you know, they're very good. Very good. I can manfully say no, that is the only travel agent that ever lived in England, uh, to come out of England, that sell a ticket to the Caribbean for 99 pounds. <laughs> yeah. And I don't you know how many years you want to go back, but that will always be something that I don't think many people can boast about. We, as Uncle Sam's Travel, bring people from the Caribbean for 199 return. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I, I know, there was a company, Caledonia,